much uh, for the invitation and for uh, this introduction. Uh, uh, good evening uh, to everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. It's the first time that I'm in Scotland and uh, I will try to rebalance a little bit my um, distribution of time across Europe and across the world of visiting more of your fantastic uh, places. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here to talk uh, about uh, this topic, measuring and fostering the well-being at uh, local level. Actually, as uh, you heard, I had a, a strange career. I'm an economist by training, then I became an econometrician, then uh, I worked in the statistical uh, uh, office, then I moved to the OECD as a, a chief statistician, and then back to Italy as a Italian uh, the president of the Italian Statistical Office, and finally I became Minister of Labor and Social Policies in the previous government until uh, 10 months ago, and now back to the university. Let's say back to square one, someone says. So I'm a former a lot of things. But uh, what I want to try to convey to you this evening uh, is really the sense of this world movement that is going on on this topic. I'm not going to talk about methodological issues. You will not see, I think, any formula in my presentation. But uh, we will address uh, a very key issue for uh, the modern societies and uh, for policy making. So it's not about uh, only measuring, but it's really uh, how to foster well-being, especially in a time of crisis that uh, we are living. So let me start uh, immediately with uh, the fact that made me, made me very proud. In October 2014, uh, we celebrated uh, the 10th anniversary of the first OECD World Forum on Statistics, Knowledge and Policy that I organized in Sicily, in Palermo, with more than 500 people, which led uh, to the start of uh, a process that uh, I would say 10 years later became a world movement, normally known as Beyond GDP, but it's much more than that. And Beyond, Beyond GDP was a label that we invented uh, only to show the others that uh, looked like a, a statistical problem, but actually was a very political problem. And then once we have uh, reinforced our statistical way of thinking, then we try and we keep trying to move uh, towards uh, the political dimension. By the way, do you know what is the origin of the word the statistics? It's a science of the state. And you can think about the state uh, the state of things, but also the state as the government. This is why what we are talking about today is highly political. And of course, I will be talking uh, in, uh, I would say, national terms, but uh, I will also show you that the same approach could be applied at local level and actually is being applied, especially at local level. There are hundreds of initiatives around the world on, that try to implement these concepts at local level. Look at this sentence. Work on developing alternative measures of progress beyond GDP must receive the dedicated attention of the United Nations, international financial institutions, the scientific community, and public institutions. These metrics must be squarely focused on measuring social progress, human well-being, justice, justice, security, equality, and sustainability. Poverty measures should reflect the multidimensional nature of poverty. New measures of subjective well-being are potentially important new tools for policy making. This is a sentence taken out of the so-called synthesis report published by the U.S. Secretary General that now the entire world is discussing in preparation of the Sustainable Development Goals Agreement that is supposed to be uh, to take place in September 2015 uh, at the General Assembly of the UN. I was very proud that this sentence was written. 
I was very proud actually because of this report by two points. One was uh, the fact that the Secretary General had picked up uh, our recommendations of the group that the Principal just mentioned uh, about the data revolution for sustainable development. But also this sentence made me very happy, especially because I didn't write it. Which means that uh, this kind of messages finally arrived uh, to the United Nations, uh, not through me, but with the movement that we tried to establish. Actually, the last 10 years were, as I said, really important. Starting from the October 2004 with the first OECD World Forum, we established the OECD, actually the global project on measuring the progress of societies. And, uh, in July 2007, the second OECD World Forum in Istanbul, and we signed with the UN, uh, the Conference of Islamic uh, Countries, uh, World Bank, uh, European Commission, and many others, the so-called Istanbul Declaration. In September 2007, uh, 2007 the uh, European Conference on Beyond GDP was established and uh, the beginning of 2008 the so-called Stiglitz Saint Fitus Commission was established and actually uh, just before the European Conference I had suggested to Christine Lagarde who at the time was Minister of Finance to establish this commission and it was a very interesting experience working with five Nobel Prize winners some of them we thought that they were dead, but this is another story. Uh, when we received uh, an email from Kenneth Arrow, someone said that, but is this a joke? No, no, it wasn't a joke. Uh, Kenneth Arrow was uh, absolutely participating in the commission and so on. So in, September, in uh, uh, December 2009, that was really the key point to break, I would say, the ice in terms of communication. In August, uh, the, European Commission com uh, the European Commission published a communication on GDP and beyond. By the way, they discussed internally whether it was better to have a beyond GDP, but then the economic uh, uh, directorate said, no, no, this doesn't look like something that economists can accept. So they ended with GDP and beyond. Um, and then uh, in September 2009, we published the OECD framework on equitable and sustainable well-being. Then uh, the Stiglitz Saint Fitus report was published at the beginning of, two, of September. The French took uh, this idea to the G20 meeting in Pittsburgh uh, at the end of September. In October 2009, the third OECD World Forum was uh, organized uh, in uh, uh, South Korea, and the OECD announced its roadmap towards the idea of embracing the well-being uh, measurement and policy framework as the framework for the organization. Actually, the OECD in 2011, uh, that now brings together the 34 most developed countries of the world, that changed its motto. It was the 50th anniversary, and they decided, uh, first of all, to start publishing the Better Life uh, Index and they established this Better Life initiative. You can find a lot of things on their website. And then they, they decided to change the motto. The motto was uh, for a better world economy and they decided to change it into better policies for better lives. And if you go to the OECD conference center in Paris, you are surrounded by this idea of better life and that policies should aim at improving not only economic growth but people's lives. Then uh, there was the fourth OECD World Forum in India in 2012. In 2013, together with Joe Stiglitz, we established the Strategic Forum on Equitable and Sustainable Wellbeing to discuss every year the measurement issues. The OECD has established a new Stiglitz Commission that is meeting uh, this week, by the way. And then uh, in August 2014, uh, the, the European Commission report on uh, the European statistical system work on how to measure well-being was published. You can find, if you are interested, on the 
website uh, www.wikiprogress.org that we established in 2007, a huge literature of these topics and you will discover that this kind of ideas now are implemented around the world, both in developed and in developing countries. What is the theoretical background of what I'm talking about? There are two elements of background. First is why should the production of uh, indicators on well-being change the society? And policies. Second is how can we frame the well-being concept to try to measure it. I don't have time this evening to elaborate on the first point, but uh, if you look at all the models developed using, for example, game theory and applying these models to democratic games, you immediately find uh, the conclusion of this uh, kind of approach. Uh, a voter normally votes only if the utility is higher than the cost of voting. In the cost of voting, there is a cost of informing himself or herself about what's going on in the country, region, city, and so on. Now, the problem is that there is an asymmetry between the information available for policy makers and especially politicians elected and citizens. Therefore, politicians can use this asymmetric information to tell stories to citizens who vote not necessarily for the best existing politicians. Sharing data about what's going on in a society change this game. And in particular, all these models show that if citizens could observe the outcomes of policies, in the second round they would select the best politicians instead of being slaves of propaganda. This is the point of, about managing a democracy in the information age, when we are really bombarded by information every single day and it's very difficult to understand how things are going really. So if you go back to the idea that statistics is science of the state, what I'm talking here about is a sort of societics. It doesn't work very well in English, in French it works better. It's the idea that statistics now are <coughs> so vital for the functioning of the democracy that we can really make a step forward, forward towards the implementation of those models based on game theory. As I said, I don't have time to elaborate on this. Then, of course, you have the neurosciences that tell you that voters normally vote based on guts and not on the brain. And I would recommend you to read a fantastic book that is called The Political Brain. And the subtitle is Why Americans Love uh, Democrats and Vote for Republicans. <laughs> and there's a 40 years of review of uh, political uh, presidential elections in the United States based on uh, the neurosciences. And by the way, in the book you will also find uh, the result of, of the test. They try to scan through the exactly how to improve 
this rationality, how to improve the democratic game, how to improve the selection of uh, uh, politicians. Let me uh, ask you to guess who said this sentence. We have used GDP to determine wrongfully what is in fact the state of well-being of the country. GDP is necessary, but inadequate. And we need to develop additional indices that will tell a more comprehensive and more holistic story about how human society is progressing. The human being has two needs, the needs of the body and the needs of the mind. And what we have focused on so far is mostly the body, perhaps only the body. So it's a paradigm shift that we need to make. Anyone wants to guess? Who? No. The, prime, the former Prime Minister of Bhutan. You may know that Bhutan's king, uh, the Bhutanese king has launched in 1970 the idea of replacing GDP with uh, uh, gross national happiness. And this is what uh, the Prime Minister of Bhutan said at the Istanbul Forum in 2007. You have another opportunity. We have a very different measure of what constitutes progress in this country. We measure progress by how many people can find a job that pays the mortgage. Whether you can put a little extra money away at the end of each month so you can someday watch your child receive her college diploma. Not by the number of billionaires we have or the profits of the Fortune 500. By whether someone with a good idea can take a risk and start a new business. Whether the waitress who leaves on tips can take a day off to look after a sick kid without losing her job and economy that honors the dignity of working. Who has said that? Obama? Right, you won uh, uh, something and uh, <laughs> City Council <laughs> will give you uh, something. What the money, yes. not the body gift, right? <laughs> Uh, Obama said that accepting the nomination as a candidate uh, for the Democrats. Third opportunity and last opportunity. Many people looked at US GDP growth in the years 2000 and said, uh, how fast you are growing, we must imitate you. But it was not sustainable or equitable growth. Even before the crash, most people were worse off than they were in the year 2000. It was a decade of decline for most Americans. Joe Stiglitz. But the point here is fundamental. If instead of looking at the per capita GDP, we looked at the average GDP, we had looked at the median GDP, so looking also at the distribution, the OECD would have never published a publication called Going for Growth using US as a model. Well, we did it just looking at the average GDP per capita. So you see the power of indicators. And in fact, Amartya Sen always said, look, talking about indicators is a way to talk about the final goals of a society. Don't forget this sentence, because indicators were invented to indicate where we want to go and whether we are going there or not. This is what we are talking about here. The most political issue that you can imagine for a community, for a country, for a world. In the Istanbul Declaration in 2007, we clearly said that we want to measure and foster the progress of societies. By the way, we revamped the word progress 
So the point is not just to copy what the OECD, UN, or uh, European Commission, or whoever thinks your progress means. The first step is to sit down and start thinking what progress means for me, for us. When uh, uh, President Sarkozy established the Stiglitz Commission, the American press immediately said, oh, look, these are usual French behavior. They can't promise growth anymore, so they just wanted to change the focus on something else to say we did it. This was not the aim, but these are the most recent uh, uh, OECD forecasts for GDP growth over the next 50 years. In terms of advanced economies, we are lucky if we make a 2% per year on average. And given the demographic, demographic uh, trends, this is not going to be enough to give full employment or to change really our standard of living today. So to be very frank, even if uh, you think that you want to be opportunistic in terms of policy making, shouldn't you start thinking about what you should promise as politicians to avoid to be, let's say, uh, dismissed every year waiting for growth that doesn't come anymore. This is of course a very, let's say, tough sentence. But don't you think that, uh, especially at European level, we always hear next year growth, like uh, the Jewish would say next year in Jerusalem for a lot of time. And in fact, even if we had growth, this wouldn't be necessarily equally distributed within the society. In publishing this paper by the OECD, the OECD said that the developed countries, in order to try to speed up growth, will cut their costs, which means uh, in a nutshell, cut salaries. And this will increase uh, inequality within the society. And this will be unsustainable. And in fact, The Guardian published an article based on this paper, and the title was, the headline was, uh, Capitalism has already given its best for developed countries, and will give its best by 2013 for developing countries. What's next? In other words, do we know how to manage a democracy that doesn't grow? Do we have a clue on how to do it? How can we say to a poor person, don't worry, you are poor, but your kids, or maybe your nephews, will be much better than you. So keep going. This is exactly what the capitalism has been for the last uh, 70 years, maybe more. And together with growth, a lot of very good things came, education, health, and so on and so forth. But also we destroyed the environment, we exhausted some resources. Climate change is coming. So the question is, should we continue to assume that growth is by definition the solution of all problems? Or should we think in different terms? This is the, the key point about why GDP growth, and I will show you a bit later, is not anymore a good indicator. In 2009, we tried to figure out how to frame a framework for well-being. And we said, that, OK, we have to care about the human system and the ecosystem together. The two systems are, of course, connected to each other. And uh, what we have to focus in is on the human well-being, the two components, individual and social well-being, but also the ecosystem conditions. Not because we are really necessarily interested in uh, natural. But even if we want to be just selfish, we must care about the ecosystem's conditions. Economy, governance, culture are not the final ends of what we do. Are very important intermediate goals, but they are not the final goals. This is why we tried to figure out uh, what we should look at uh, uh, if we want to 
try to measure well-being overall. And we said for the economic condition, we have ecosystem condition, we have to look at land, geosphere, freshwater, oceans, seas, biodiversity, air. And as far as uh, the human well-being uh, uh, is concerned, we should focus on physical and mental health, knowledge and understanding, work and leisure, of course, material well-being, freedom and self-determination, and interpersonal relations. We try to identify these key elements, also looking at these hundreds of initiatives around the world. But then we said, we shouldn't just look at averages. We have to look at the equity dimension. And the equity dimension has two components. One is for the current generation, and the other is equity between generations. So we added these two components, the intragenerational dimension, which is normally what we call inequality, in terms of income distribution, health, education, and so on and so forth. And the intergenerational dimension, which is about sustainability. The impact of our behaviors today on future generations. Of course, you could say, well, I agree with Grucho Marx and uh, Grucho, not Karl. Grucho Marx and Woody Allen, who said, uh, why should I care about future generations? What did they do for me? <laughs> Which is a very serious question. This is why the concept of sustainability doesn't necessarily help in changing, because it's about the future. But look at the dual of sustainability, which means vulnerability and resilience. What if one day the oil price goes down by 50%? Is this about sustainability? Of course it is about sustainability. Because it's a change in external conditions or markets or whatever, and then maybe you have to reinvent a community, you have to reinvent a society. Or maybe you can say, well, this is just a temporary, it will go back. Of course, it will go back. What about climate change? Is it going back? What about uh, those trends of GDP growth? So the fact that uh, the future can become real now for me, change the perspective. The mayor of Vienna many years ago taxed the city to build the walls around the river. And he was remembered for 100 years as the worst uh, city mayor because he had taxed the city. Then after 100 years there was a flood there and people said, oh, thanks God that uh, fantastic mayor had saved uh, the city. Do we have this kind of uh, long-term perspective? Or do we just care about what's going on today, here, tomorrow, and then we'll see? Of course, as I said, uh, there are many variables that are important national income, wealth, human rights, civic and political engagement, <coughs> many other things. So we ended with this idea that uh, progress comes from an increase in equitable and sustainable well-being. Which is a complicated concept, but it's a really encompassing, holistic concept. And the OECD had developed this framework on the well-being, with the main components of individual well-being, health, work-life balance, education and skills, social connections, civic engagement and governance, environmental quality, personal security, and subjective well-being, which are the red arrows uh, were present in our 2009 framework. And then we have also the sustainability dimension which is about uh, the consume of capital that we do. Produce capital, natural capital, human capital, social capital. Because capital 
links the decisions today with the, the decisions tomorrow. This is a quite well structured, of course, framework. And by the way, as you can see on the top, the population averages and the differences across groups. That is the intergenerational inequality, while on the bottom, the capital dimension is the intergenerational dimension. We have a problem here. If I ask you now, are you happy? Maybe you would answer, depending on how cold is here, or how interesting is my speech, uh, and so on. So on. Well, uh, if I ask you, how satisfied are uh, you with your life, you would follow a completely different path. You would look at your expectations for your life, what you have done, and so on. It would be a sort of balance sheet of uh, your life. In the happiness uh, literature, the first one is called uh, affects. So it's instantaneous happiness. Interesting for psychology, for behaviors, not really for what we are talking what matters most for here is life satisfaction. But where does life satisfaction come from? It comes from health, your material uh, well-being, uh, your education, your work, and so on and so forth. So isn't subjective well-being a duplication of the other components? This question was something that I couldn't really solve for a few years. Finally, at the beginning of 2013, uh, during uh, uh, an international working group meeting we had in Bhutan uh, with 40 experts from all over the world, uh, a chart came to my mind uh, and I could design it on the side uh, with a piece of wood. And that chart became the reference of the so-called new economic development paradigm that has been presented to the United Nations and also on the paper that we published in, on Nature. This is the chart. In the old paradigm, we were focusing on human needs. Then we invented our societies, our economies, with the idea that we had to produce GDP, of course, it's a very simplified way of thinking. So, human needs, machinery, output. Then we said, no, no, we want to be more sustainable. So we added the different forms of capital, the four capitals that I talked about. And then we said that it's not only GDP, it's equitable and sustainable well-being, health, Where is happiness here, or life satisfaction? As I said, it's either a, du a duplication, or according to the Bentham's philosophy, it's just replacing everything, like uh, Lord Layard is uh, suggesting in his studies. Then, during the conference, someone said, oh, one day I met a person who was in prison for 15 years, and he said uh, afterwards that where was the most uh, happy period of, her, of his life. Because he was completely ignorant, thanks to being in prison, he learned how to read and write, and now he is a great writer. So I said to myself, look, this guy was able to derive happiness from a very, very bad situation. So maybe the mistake that we were making was to add life satisfaction and happiness to the other dimensions. While maybe the model is a multiplicative one. Our capacity of extracting happiness from what we have depends on our happiness skills. So we have health, we have material, and so on and so forth. And depending on our happiness skills, we are able to transform this into happiness. Why should I care about this? As a, politi a politician, as an economist, why should I care about this? We are scared of having an ethical state. This is why in the Western countries we don't want to have the government talking about happiness of individuals. But now, neurosciences, behavioral economics, and so on, tell us that if people
Psychology tells us what religions told us for centuries, for a lot of time. That part of these happiness skills can be teached. It's a happiness. You went too often to, uh, to Bhutan. Are you becoming a Buddhist? Okay, let's replace happiness with resilience. Does it work better for you? Is it something that you are more used to think? Your capacity of uh, reacting positively when something goes wrong? Your capacity of uh, being uh, satisfied instead of fighting every single day with what you don't have and so on. So it's just to say that maybe in this way we shouldn't care about happiness per se, but the way in which the subjective dimension of life works helps the society to work better, the economy to work better. And even the needs are not human needs anymore because we should take care of planetary boundaries and the, the ecosystem conditions since the beginning and not just to correct a negative external. With the sustainable development goals that all countries in the world are negotiating now, we are making progress from this point of view, indeed. You can see here references uh, to sustainable use of uh, ecosystems and so on and so forth, but also promote peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development. And also you can find equitable inclusive uh, quality education, and so on and so forth. So if it works, in September 2015, for the first time ever, the world will have a single universal agenda, instead of saying that the developed countries go in one direction and developing countries have their own agenda. Associated to these 17 goals, there are 169 targets. Then, so I, I'm not just saying uh, buy into this. Just to say that the world is discussing exactly about this. In the introduction, uh, there was a reference to what uh, we did in Italy with the so-called equitable and sustainable well-being uh, project that I launched when I was president of the statistical office, and uh, we established a pro process engaging the civil society, the experts, to try to derive a framework of indicators to measure equitable and sustainable well-being, to evaluate whether Italy is moving in the right direction or wrong. First of all, we run a survey, statistical survey on 24,000 households in the context of our normal social survey, and that we ask people, what does matter to you for your well-being. Then uh, we establish a steering committee with representatives of the trade unions, business associations, third sector, non-profit, uh, and so on and so forth. And we ask them uh, to identify the key domains of well-being. Once this was done, we gave this to experts, university experts, researchers, and so on. And they came back uh, with a potential list of indicators for each domain. This was discussed again, and finally we ended with a system of 134 indicators, a little bit too many, anyway, and every two years we publish a report, which is not just data, it is also a description of what happened, what is happening, and so on and so forth. When we asked to Italians what uh, matters for your well-being, uh, the first was being in good health. It's not a surprise. Uh, we were a little bit surprised by the fact that they could guarantee the future of their children socially and economically. This is classical Italian culture, let's say, with positive and negative elements, of course. But it looks like the intergenerational equity is very strong, but in fact, uh, this is why now Italy has uh, the toughest, I would say, legislation in terms of pension. And uh, nothing really happened to all people who accepted this. Not very happily, happily, but anyway, they did it. These are the 12 domains that we finally selected. As you can see, there are eight domains, including subjective well-being, so in a sense, we made the same mistakes
rates of the OECD, um, and this is exactly the demonstration that I was still struggling with this when uh, we did it. And then four, um, four dimensions in the context, landscape and, uh, and cultural heritage, research and innovation, quality of services, policy and institutions, which are enablers, if you wish, of uh, the process, not really relevant for individuals. So, after then, we did the, uh, the national initiative we, uh, and the regional data. We went down to 15 uh, major Italian cities with the so-called Urbus project. In the legislation, it says uh, that uh, we should be able to monitor the impact of uh, uh, smart cities initiatives on citizens' well-being at city level. The main uh, economic uh, and financial documents that all countries, European countries, have to publish every year, there was a clear reference to the BES, the Benessere Eco Sostenibile, Equitable and Sustainable Well-being, and they proposed to use this as uh, the uh, framework for the impact assessment of new legislation. And uh, of course, we are using, uh, we are continuing research, especially on sustainability and resilience. And now some regions are using the BES framework to also develop their strategic plans. What did we learn here uh, as a lesson? Uh, as lessons, first of all, we need to have a, you need to have, if you want to start, a broad discussion with different actors. You have only one shot. And you must do it rightly. Because if the process is seen as an instrumental by one institution against the others, by one party against the others, it doesn't work. And uh, it would be very difficult to do it again. So it's important to take time and think carefully. But the engagement, not just consultation, engagement of the different components of the society is uh, as important as uh, the content of, uh, the, of the structure. It's a long and delicate process, not necessarily costly, but uh, it can be difficult to, to sustain it depending on the change in the political cycles. As I, as I said, there are hundreds of initiatives like this. If you look at the Community Indicators Consortium in the United States, you will find that hundreds of initiatives on the United States. Uh, good news, the international measurement agenda keeps going uh, at uh, Eurostat level, OECD level, UN, several national initiatives, including of course UK, and finally even Germany is making this. I was invited to the German Chancellor in September to try to teach them how to do it. So, as you can see, even if even Germans do that, of course they have now a Panzer Division and, and they will do it perfectly. It took me 10 years to convince them, but anyway. But you could ask myself, but really, does it make a change if you look at, instead of GDP, at well-being? Let me show you just quickly a few charts. This is the Euro area. GDP, dotted line, and uh, household income, disposable income. Oh, mm -hmm. 
published every single quarter on the Eurostat website. Don't be curious about this. I have to go quickly towards the end. This is the difference between your expectation about your happiness in future and your current life satisfaction. In 2012 and in 2015, in 2005, sorry. A negative bar means that you are more pessimistic in 2012 uh, compared to 2005 over the next five years. Does this pessimism explain anything about uh, the recovery in Europe, uh, continental Europe? Uh, doesn't come back. Trust in institutions, left hand side chart. Percentage of people who trust national governments, right hand side. Percentage of people who trust others. On the left of the second chart, we have uh, only 12% of people who trust other people in Portugal, maybe 15% in France. And then at the opposite, you have Denmark, 70% of people trust others. Norway, Finland, Sweden, Netherlands. It must be a geographical bias, maybe a virus. This is a fantastic publication by the OECD. How was life? They tried to rebuild time series since 1820 just to see the correlation between uh, GDP growth and other dimensions of well-being. Very interesting chart. On the left-hand side down, inequality. Which shows that inequality and GDP over the years may have quite different uh, evolution. Finally, again, this is a recent OECD uh, study that shows that inequality had a negative impact on GDP growth. And by the way, this is the evolution of uh, share, income share of the top 0.1% in the United States. The bottom uh, area is the salary, which means uh, that in 1971, because of just a salary component, the top 0.1 had 1% of GDP, sorry, 1% of uh, the total income share, and this went up to 3%. The other components are mostly related to capital, which means uh, changes in stock options, uh, uh, investments uh, in financial instruments, not on normal salary. Which shows, of course, that this is a very cumulative process. Let me conclude at this point with uh, uh, what I try to do after being a minister. I try to evaluate uh, in a qualitative way the impact of all the measures uh, we took uh, during the 10 months of our government on the equitable and sustainable social indicators that we had selected uh, as statistical office. Green means uh, the positive expected impact, red means uh, a negative expected impact. This is just to say that uh, trying to evaluate uh, the a sort of impact assessment of uh, policies looking at the well-being uh, could be done. Let me conclude. There are several obstacles to transform uh, this statistical agenda into a political agenda. A recent report made by a European group shows that the main uh, obstacles are the lack of democratic legitimacy, lack of underpinning theory and narrative, lack of a clear political imperative, the need for organizational changes because our governments are structured according to the old paradigm and not the new paradigm. Uh, technical questions with indicators, institutional resistance to change, and no widely used
and analytical tools for integrated innovative economic policy making. Advisors to ministers of finance, for example, use the classical economic models, econometric models, which do not um, estimate the social and the environmental dimensions of a policy. Recently, two reports were published uh, in UK, one Wellbeing and Policy by Gus O'Donnell and others for the Lagatum Institute, and the other one is Wellbeing in Four Policy Areas by the UK All Party Parliamentarian Group on Wellbeing Economics. And the second report in particular recommends some actions uh, in order to move towards, uh, I would say, uh, full well-being uh, uh, focused uh, set of policies, no matter which party is expected uh, to run these policies. Of course you could say, and I'm stopping here in the last two slides, but what about the crisis? Are you still talking about these things while Europe is still in crisis and many others? Last guess for you. In such a spirit, on my part and on yours, we face our common difficulties. They concern, thank God, only material things. Values have shrunken to fantastic levels, our ability to pay is found, the means of exchange are frozen. More important, a host of unemployed citizens face the green problem of the system. The people of this country have been erroneously encouraged to believe that they could keep on increasing the output indefinitely that some magician would find ways and means for that increased output to be consumed with reasonable profits to the producer. Without regard to party, the overwhelming majority of our people seek a greater opportunity for humanity to prosper and find happiness. They recognize that human welfare has not increased and does not increase through materialism and luxury, but it does progress through integrity and selfishness 